And now, live from the 2015 Vancouver International Wine Festival, Anthony Gizmondi and Casey Wilson. This is Tony and Casey's Best of Food and Wine on Sea Isle 650. But the smile on his face quickly turns to a sneer as the barman says sadly, the pub's got no beer. Welcome back to the Best of Food and Wine. I'm Tony Gismondi. I'm Casey Wilson. Uh, Australia is the theme uh, country here, and they're cleaning up this week uh, with consumers who seem to be nuts about Australian wine and really buying into what's going on in Australia. Our next guest, Mark Conroy, is from Piramima Winery. Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Uh, hey, your voice is like mine. It's fading. I'm yeah. going to get yes. you to move your mic up just a bit. No so problem at all. There, now we can really hear that you've been out till about 5 in the morning. Now we're laughing and dancing. Mark, <laughs> what beautiful labels you have. It's take a lot of work, those labels. Yeah. Yes, I'll see. He does each one himself, Casey. Well, funny you say that. The gold, the gold emblems are done by hand. Yeah. But they don't oh. let me do it anymore because I put them on crooked. <laughs> <laughs> How are you, Mark? I'm very well, very well indeed. You are uh, quite an interesting guy. One, you brought us PV, Petit Verdot, which we no one would think very much about from Australia. Uh, give us a bit of history about that. And Absolutely. The, um, it's... The current owner of the uh, company is, the, is uh, Jeffrey Johnston. The family's been involved in McLaren Vale since 1890, the winery. The same family owned and family operated. And he was on a trip to Bordeaux in the early 80s and he saw PV there and decided, gee whiz, the Bordelais can't get it right. We, we can. <laughs> we so, can, yeah. So we planted the first block in 80, 80, 81, sorry. Yep. And we're, so we're on our 34th vintage this year. Because it's a variety that needs a long time to ripen in. And, yeah, I mean, in Bordeaux, we see, when I talk about Bordeaux, like 45, 61, those vintages, 82. When the Petit Bordeaux ripened, they had these magical vintages. Absolutely. But you seem to be able to do it on a much more consistent basis. Absolutely. I mean, 1990 in Bordeaux as well. They, but as it disappeared there, we took up the slack. So. Yeah. But um, it definitely, it's a late ripener. It, uh, surprisingly, when... When I first arrived at Piramimera, I was surprised by the lack of canopy. So I thought, wow, this is going to be sunburnt. But when the heat wave nest comes through in, in our area, normally February, the, the Petit Verdot is only about six or seven bow may, so you're not getting any cellular damage yeah. to the, on the, into the skin, into the grape. So, yeah. so is it risky to grow? Not ne- no, not necessarily. I think it handles, it handles the temperature zone well. Without a problem, yeah, and you and you get very good varietal character out of out of the, out of this Mediterranean temperature. And but you know historically it was a grape that was blended, Absolutely. so like doing it with a hundred percent. What 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 are the changes or how how does that work for it? Oh, I don't think that's that's an issue because it actually has good length of flavour. I mean, yeah, there's, you different blocks will give you different characters, so you can end up with very tannic. You can get it with a very tannic, low yielding sort of clone. We try to crop it around three and a half tons, so we, we're, not, we're not making it quite a tannic style, but we're looking for elegance at the same time. So we're looking for some musk, and we t- typically get musk and violets, mm-hmm. and we get some cursed musk, cherry. that's a great yeah. name, yeah. yeah. Cursed okay. cherry. Okay, let's back it up a bit. Piramima, uh, McLaren Vale. Yep. Maybe we should set the stage for people. and yep. tell, tell us a little bit about that special place, McLaren Vale. And- well, it is a pretty special place. So it's only 30 miles south of the capital of South Australia, which is Adelaide. Yep. So you follow the coastline down, 30 mile, magnificent beaches. Um, if you're fast enough to swim, you know, with the great whites won't get you. So it's nice. But um, <laughs> the, um, it's a fantastic area to grow grapes. We don't have frost issues. Yep. We um, you get a, ocean influence because you're you're close enough. Well, we find it's pretty well segmented, like the Napa Valley to a certain extent. We there's a lot of sub regions, probably yep. 10 or 12. As you get closer to the range, you'll get more black peppers in your Shiraz. Top of the range, you'll get white peppers. Close to the ocean, you'll get more black fruits. Mm-hmm. West. So it depends on the soil profiles. There's eight or ten ma- radically different soil profiles, from ironstone to limestone, sandstones, red marley clay. So we'd have eight types just in our, in our vineyards. And just for our listeners, like eight types of soil, what, so what, how does that affect the wine? What, what is it? A, is it a texture thing or is it a flavor thing or is it all of that? Or? It's funny. We have, we have different theories about this. Yeah, I'm sure you do. <laughs> I, think, I think that ironstone adds color. I'm not sure, but it just seems those blocks seem to have more Better color. color. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And the black soil can be a bit tricky. It holds too much moisture sometimes, so you've got to be a little bit careful. But 
Yeah, I mean, we haven't done enough analysis on that, really. Mm -hmm. We should do more. But that some of the but you the, know, there's a difference absolutely. from fruit that grows on all the different soils. Well, we would line up 60 Shiraz on the bench when we're tasting Shiraz, putting together wine. So, and they're all individually different, really. If you if you look at those nuances, the fine nuances, yeah, which we would see. Sure. Well, hopefully. Well, yeah. Why not? Mark, there's not a lot of wines that go with smoked foods, but I think this is this one definitely would a petite. Bordeaux, and I'm thinking like a smoked chicken, not smoked salmon, that would be too much, yeah. but say a smoked chicken, it would be great with a spaghetti, with pasta, you know, meat sauces, yeah. and... I think you're right. We're making a medium-weighted style with elegance, really, and it's got still got structure, but if you... And absolutely, with, with pastas or pizza, or I use it at home with... I use Cajun chicken, chicken actually. So, oh, really? And pork. That's a great idea. So we grow our own little piglets, and we roast them up. And I think also it would go really well with hard cheeses. Yes. Yep. Parmesan and some of v the really vintage, vintage cheddars, yes. Yes, yes. exactly. Mark, you're, uh, you're a young guy, but you, you spent 35 years in the business already. You're not that young, really. Yeah. It's just when you drink two bottles of Tanat a day, you live yeah, to 100. You look to be, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm with you. Uh, it's been a big change in 35 years. Oh, Are absolutely. You, absolutely. And... and do you embrace the change? Is it something that Australians like to do? or I, th I think we we take a lot of risks. So planting Petit Verdot was one, planting yeah. Tanat. We've just put a new block in of Tempranillo, white Frontenac that no one wants to play with anymore. We thought we'll, have, we'll put that yeah, in. Give so, that in. Absolutely. So Italian varieties is something I've got to get across through to the owner that he's not... He's, he doesn't want to play with, but that's what I do. But yeah, yeah. Look, eventually. But we, look, the marketplace is, is a paradigm shift, and it changes radically the, the the world market of wine, and this is a saturation point at the moment as well. So, the Australian dollar did a lot of damage to our industry, being too high. Being too high, yeah. 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 It's did, always did a problem. Could you repeat that? The the Australian dollar did a lot of damage. Oh, yeah. I see. Yeah. Right. That's. That's difficult. Where's the name from, Piramima? Piramima is an Aboriginal, Indigenous uh, people's name, meaning the moon and the stars. Mm. And here I thought they were all about That's water, so all those names. <laughs> well, that, that we need water, there's no doubt about that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let, we, let's do these two wines. I know yep. we'll run out of time yep. before we get to them. So yep. we have two very special uh, bottlings that uh, you brought along. Tell us a little bit about each of them. Right, the first, the one, the second wine you're yep. going to try is the is the ACJ. Yeah. Which is named after ACJ. ACJ. Yeah. Named after the Scottish founder. Yeah. So Alexander Campbell Johnston, who started the the winery in 1890. Uh, it's traditionally a it's a it's a barrel blend. So I taste four or five thousand barrels. It takes me six weeks. Goes, wow. And what I'm trying to do is get all the layers on the palate. So I'm looking for the five layers which run through your palate. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a criteria or a set varietal. It's, mm -hmm. it's what comes best in the vintage. And that's as far as fruit profile, regional character, varietal character. So, And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for more length of flavour running through the palate with this wine. And so longevity. It, yeah, it changes every year then, the blender. Well, we've only made four in the 120 years, but this, yeah. the, la the four have been radically different. Yeah. Okay. And it's a great bottle. It's a very tall bottle. Well, that's, that's an Australian-made bottle. The the, uh, the War Horse is actually an imported bottle. So, oh, yeah. I see. Imported. Imported, yeah. Wow. Not in, important as well, yes. Yeah. Yes. I can see it's kind of it's kind of like a stubby, <laughs> stubby. Uh, stubby Bordeaux bottle. Stubby Bordeaux. Yeah. You did some, uh, uh, I would say, uh, really groundbreaking work about alcohol. Am I not right that you... The, the, the owner did, yes. Yeah, he, he they, just, they did a whole bunch of stuff looking at levels of alcohol and how it affected wine. Has that changed the way wine is made at Paramima? Oh, uh, he, he had this... Apparently there was a trend, according to, according to him, that, that uh, there's a massive demand for low-alcohol wine. So he... He actually perfected the dealkalization of wine, yeah, of machine, and we, with with the, with the help of of one of the manufacturers in Australia. But we found that the Australian consumer doesn't want yeah low alcohol wine. He yeah. wants to drink until he falls over. So was it too much intervention? Or I remember once doing a tasting like 16, 15, 14, 13, and yeah. we were supposed to decide which wine we like. But it's probably not the way to make wine. It would no, be absolutely. Better to get that in the vineyard in, absolutely. in the long run. Hundred percent. I mean, the, the problem is with dealking. If you you take out your sweet spot, alcohol gives you the sweet spot in the middle yeah. palate. So we found with the white, it was tasted reasonable. You didn't lose your varietal character or your flesh, but. With the reds, mm -hmm. they it, were gone. It stripped them, yeah. But we, this was more of a, a range we released. Someone demanded it in the UK, and yeah. didn't necessarily work. So we we canned that pretty quickly. Yes. 
it's, they don't pay you enough anyway in the UK well, the, for your wines. The weird part about that is that the cost of doing it is quite radical. The time, the is time, it? the time, the time it is quite exhaustive. So it's not something you want to do. No. Yeah. But other other companies have followed us since and done it. So they have. I am just. Uh, very happy with this war horse. Oh, you're on the war horse now, are you? Yeah. Wow. So th that is amazing. The war horse has got a lot of history. I mean, it was planted by POWs in 1944. They were displaced Italian POWs. They lived at the winery, and, and in those days we had 3,000 acres. So they looked after the dairy and the piggery, and they planted the Grenache block and the Shirar block at the top of the property. And it's named in honour of them and, and the Clydesdales that worked from 1892 to 1952. And all the Clydesdales are documented in the minute books, how much we paid for them, how much they weighed, their really? whole colour. Oh, yeah. And they're buried in the middle of this vineyard in an old derelict almond grove which sits in the middle of the Grenache block. Oh, my goodness. And so they're buried in there. So the family had a, a, a very close association with the horses. So they used to walk across to the township, to the blacksmith shop themselves and come back. <laughs> and so they're all buried and named in, in, in the vineyard. In the vineyard. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. a great story. So they're a little bit in them in the wine. <laughs> well, unfortunately, there's no grapes on top of them, but still. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, they're there somewhere. They did all the work. Wow. I, well, I guess if you're going to be a POW, Australia was, uh, wasn't such a bad place to go. No, the, most of them came from the Molinese Campania area, and, yeah. they, and there was two or three worked in each winery. This is a 2010. Uh, a lot of people talk about that vintage in Australia. Are you happy with that vintage as well? Or? Well, if you, if you made a bad wine in 2010, you, you should, should be shoot, shot. Shoot, shot. You hit the nail on the head. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, and, and quite an opulent vintage, but still, you've, you don't want overripe vintages where you get just your fleshy, stewed fruit. This, uh, this had beautiful richness, but as well as structure. So 10, yeah. was, 10 had everything covered. Great vintage. Yeah. yeah. Great vintage. And the oak treatment in this, is we've used four different types of oak, and we're trying to balance it up so that the oak's not dominant as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, you've been in the show for a couple of days. What what kind of, what are people asking you? What are you liking or maybe uh, not liking about it? No, I think it's I think it's unbelievable. I mean, yeah. and, and, and the last guest from New York State, he, I mean, he, he hit the nail on the head. The, the, the people here are educated. They want to learn about the wine. It's like chalk and cheese to doing it in Australia. Really? You've, got, you've got thousands of bogans want to get drunk and it's out of control. <laughs> so, so there's no doubt that this is a, this is a pleasure coming here. Yeah. Because we, we export 95 percent of our Petit Verdot. Because you do. Yeah. Canada is in love with your Petit Verdot. And, and it's a strong market for us. We yeah. now export in Japan and to Asian states and other countries. In Australia, we'd sell five percent because mm -hmm. they don't understand. Yeah. Wow. Well, and anything they can't pronounce, they don't like. <laughs> <laughs> What uh, so we've seen a sea change in the style of wines, even though I, I don't know that if you're following that path at Piramima, do you feel like that or no? Yeah, I mean we see it in Chardonnay and things Absolutely. changing, but but the red wines I think have always been great. Well, I've seen I've seen I've seen a lot of wines now that have gone heading towards an austere pattern yeah. in Australia, yeah, which is due to wine critics, which I find disturbing. Yeah. I think if you're making a style that's balanced and regardless whether it's 30 minutes in alcohol or 15 minutes in alcohol, if it's balanced and it's great on the palate and people like it, why change? Because of some wine critic. So is, is a show like this really important for you to be talking to consumers about the style of your wine? Or like, how, how do you come, or do you just feel that, you, you know, you're leading that charge yourself? You, you know what you want to do at Pyramid? You're... Yeah, I think... And, and each year, each year that your BOMO levels are different. I mean, this, this vintage is six weeks early, but yeah. we're finding that, that said, you, you're not getting a great opportunity to sit down to talk. To, they're so busy at your stand, you don't get an opportunity to discuss those matters. But it's whether they like the wine or not, initially, and we don't get into that detail. But I think, I think that's crucial. Most people, you you got them for like five seconds, eh? When they taste that that's wine, right. they that's either it. love it or they don't love it. That's right. And uh, so that whatever your style is, if, if it doesn't show up in that first five, it probably never will. Well, and that's probably why some of the, the high octane Australian Parker styles yeah. hit the spot in the early days because they jump out of a glass yeah. instantaneously. Yes. We're almost out of time, Mark. Yeah. But maybe maybe the end of Parker is a good thing for the wine business. I don't know. Well, I have another opinion on wine, wine yeah. critics. And Just whole, shoot them all, eh? No, no, the whole, I think the scenario is out of control. I think yeah. the whole point system is out of control. Yeah. I think that it's a joke that we're stuck in that vacuum of control by wine critics. I, I think it's ludicrous. Yeah. Ludicrous. I think when I do wine dinners, I tell people that the war horse got 110 out of 100 by uh, Kim Jong, the supreme dictator, because he likes to fight. <laughs> and I say the ACJ got 109 because Robert Mugabe <laughs> gave him that. So, you know, like it's, it's out of control. It's totally out of control. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> 
But yes. on the other hand, uh, <laughs> wine critics, best. I think, have got people into the into the market. People that aren't. No, that I think wine writers have shopping. wine critics are just wankers. No, well, uh, the, the point of that is that is is the fact that that yes, there's wine critics. How many how many are getting juice samples? How many are getting the real McCoy? Yeah. Where's where's the real eight questions you should be asking a winery, which is never asked? Yeah. yeah. So I think that's I think it's a, and unfortunately, certain certain play, certain markets are reliant on spectator or whatever points there must be to yeah. get to uh, sell a bottle of wine. Yeah. So that's where it's a little bit scary. Mark, we love how frank you are. I hope we a- we got, we asked at least two of the eight <laughs> questions you needed today. Not yet, not yet. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much for no joining worries. us Thanks. on the Best of Food and Wine. Make sure you go by and see Mark Conroy at Pure Mima. If you're in the room tonight, you can't miss it uh, at the Vancouver International Wine Festival. We'll take a quick break, and we'll be right back. Yep. <laughs> Lots more still ahead. Live from the 2015 Vancouver International Wine Festival, this is Tony and Casey's Best of Food and Wine on CIL 650.